Funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. Whether it's spring planting, fall harvesting, or just a drive across the state, Soy Biodiesel helps a diesel-powered engine operate in a demanding job. Soybean oil from Nebraska Soybeans makes biodiesel a renewable fuel that's also environmentally responsible. The soybean checkoff plays a major role in supporting the use and availability of biodiesel. The Nebraska Soybean Board, growing opportunity from the ground up. Fall harvest is a busy time for farmers in the Midwest. Fortunately, Market Journal is available on demand through its mobile app for smartphones and tablet devices. From our weekly marketing interviews to Al's weather forecast, the Market Journal mobile app includes all of your favorite segments from the current week, as well as from past episodes. The app features tools to assist farmers and ranchers in developing their ag strategies, such as the end-of-day markets and updated weather information. The free Market Journal mobile app is available through the iTunes Store for iPhones and iPads and through the Google Play Store for Android devices. Visit the Market Journal website to learn more. Market Journal, television for making agricultural business decisions, is a presentation of the University of Nebraska Lincoln Extension, where you can know how, know now. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine, and major funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. The Soybean Checkoff, growing opportunity from the ground up. Welcome to this week's edition of Market Journal. I'm Jeff Wilkerson. On this episode, Mike Briggs takes a look inside the cattle markets. Lauren Giesler explains why you might want to sample soil after harvest. Dave Aiken discusses the Republican River dry years plans. And through a recent UNL study, we learn how 2012's drought affected corn prices. Nebraska's weather violently spanned the spectrum towards the end of last week as heavy snow covered portions of the state's Panhandle and western South Dakota, a tornado ripped through Wayne in northeast Nebraska. In the west, where cattle losses are estimated in the tens of thousands, the Nebraska and South Dakota Departments of Agriculture are advising producers to document cattle losses for possible future use in disaster relief programs. Nebraska Governor Dave Heineman earlier this week issued an emergency declaration for areas affected by those severe storms. Mike Briggs is our marketing analyst this week. Things are slowly looking up for cattle producers as a record fall harvest moves to market. Input prices have dropped dramatically from 2012 levels. As an example, UNL's Cornhusker Economics listed corn at $4.42 a bushel in Nebraska City for September 27th. A year ago, it was $3.02 higher. While that makes a huge difference, beef demand could still be a concern as tight supplies of cattle will likely be around for at least the next year. In the meantime, there may be, for the first time in a while, some profit to be had. When we talked with Mike Wednesday afternoon, afternoon, we started by asking for his thoughts as the feedlot moved through September and into October. Well, we started to see an increase of cattle coming into the feed yard. As corn has gone down, it's given the feeder a little more opportunity to maybe carve out a little bit of a margin, so people are starting to get back into buying some cattle. That, that margin opportunity is maybe waning a little bit because as the cash market started to try to climb higher and corn keeps going down, people are pushing a little harder after the cattle. Yeah, feeder. there has been a nice little cash feeder rally here, right? Yes, there has. Yes, there has. And I think it'll, con it'll probably continue as long as corn goes down and, and the live cattle kind of stay in there. Last time when we were here, we talked about how many market-ready cattle would be here in September and October. How do you think that's fleshing out? You know, there were some people, I being one of them, thought there was going to be an awful lot of cattle that were going to come to the market at a time where typically beef demand is really bad, and I really thought they'd hammer this market up. The cattle really weren't there. So consequently, we didn't beat this live market up as bad as I thought and some other people thought we would do, and have actually started to grind it higher which is good because that means there's at least a little bit of demand in there. Um, you know, as we go forward, so does that mean we've started to hit our smaller numbers and numbers are just going to continue to get smaller from here on out? I think that's quite possible. Now that does not guarantee higher prices. It does guarantee a smaller beef supply. So, you know, maybe 
Maybe you do grind these prices higher if demand hangs in there. Yeah, and that really brings up a big concern in demand and what the consumer is willing to pay because if there's cheaper corn, the pork guys and the chicken guys can increase much more rapidly than the beef guys can, and that means that their meat is going to be cheaper. Is it a real concern that at some point you could price yourself out of that market? Oh, absolutely. We already have. I yeah. mean, chicken and pork are so much cheaper. We already have. Beef is going to become, unfortunately, a luxury item, I'm afraid. Now, I've seen some ads where the, the retailer is trying to keep hamburger down there, and that's how, how what most of beef moves like is hamburger. So, you know, maybe we'll keep that going. But it's going to be really interesting as we go forward and along on those hamburger nines because you're not going to have the cow slaughter you've had. We may have to start grinding up muscle cuts to provide hamburger. That's going to chew through a lot more cattle than you typically would too. So it's really going to be interesting going forward. I know everybody makes a big deal about getting short cattle. Well, I want to actually see what happens and we're going to see what the customer's really going to, consumer's really going to pay because he's got a lot of cheaper alternatives. Any uh, opportunity to place cattle now and make a profit? There's, there's spots, you know, you're still kind of in a situation if you really want to go out there and feed the Cadillac cattle and really try to do, you know, a first rate deal, that's not really going to be a winner for you probably on paper right away. But there's some spots out there where you can get some cattle bought and get some things done. Um, that has to be the first time in a while you've been able to actually that's, have that's that. Been, oh yeah, it, ever since corn got over $6, yeah. there's yeah. been virtually nothing. And that's what it's all about. It's all about feed costs and how cheap we can put pounds on. And now we've got an opportunity. It's going to be interesting to see how much cheaper corn can get because I know yields are very good. So I think the crop might be bigger than what the USDA anticipates, but we'll see. Tell me what your gut says on that. There hasn't been too much corn out around here. So if you're buying cash, is there an opportunity to go a little lower? Well, the big thing, we need some more corn so we can take the basis away. The basis, especially in this area with all the ethanol plants, the basis is really still out of line because there's not enough supply of corn. Once we get enough supply of corn, the basis will be the first thing to leave and that's going to lower your cash corn and give you an opportunity. I don't know how much lower the board can go until maybe the government comes out and says, hey, there's a lot more corn out here than we thought. How strong has the export market been for beef? The export market has not been bad. You know, it was kind of waning there a little bit, but it's kind of come back a little bit. And I, I think so long as the foreign economies do okay, they want, their, they want our beef, and, and I think the export market's going to hang in there provided there's not another thing going on like what's going on in our country right now. Yeah, a shutdown could really sort of shake things up, or uh, a major shakeup in the dollar could, could be a problem. Yes, and it's going to be really interesting to see what happens as we go forward. The irresponsibility in Washington is just going, coming to an incredible head. It's going to be interesting to see if anybody is... Smart enough? There you go. Smart <laughs> I think enough. it's more fact than opinion at this point. I think you're in the general, general they, population. They've got to there. do something, then they've, they've got to do something smart, yeah. So we're close enough to 2014 that uh, can you start to maybe see some, some sustained profitability here in the months ahead? That's a great question, and I just don't know because I think there's still going to be such an incredible amount of pressure on the feeder cattle market because there's so much feed bunk out here. How many people want to step out here and get after it yet? I know the corporates are staying in there, and I think the farmer feeder's going to be a real force in there because his corn's going to be worth half what it was last year, and he might decide he's just going to feed it. So I think there's going to always be a lot of upward pressure on that feeder market, and that's going to make it tough to carve out a margin. Next week, Wade Johannes from Central Valley Ag will join us to discuss corn and soybean markets. Because of a government shutdown in Washington, there was, among others, no October crop report and no report for crop progress this week. The average price for regular gasoline in the United States has dropped for the fifth straight week, this time to $3.37 per gallon. Diesel fuel dipped for the fourth consecutive week. September turned out to be a positive month for consumers as regular gas fell 18 cents per gallon during the month. The latest outlook from the U.S. Energy Information Administration forecasts an average gas price of $3.40 per gallon in 2014. Diesel fuel in that same time period is projected to average $3.76 a gallon. Soybean cyst nematode continues to be the number one problem for soybean growers in Nebraska. SCN cost the state's soybean growers more than $45 million in 2012, more than all other soybean diseases combined. It can go undetected above ground and still cause yield losses between 20 and 30 percent.
But there's a free way to see if you have the problem, courtesy of the Nebraska Soybean Board. UNL Extension plant pathologist Lauren Geisler explains how you can sample for this problem as harvest continues in Nebraska's fields. So as you continue that soybean harvest, one of the things that could be a problem in your field is soybean cyst nematode. If you're seeing pockets uh, in the field where you have lower yields and you really have not identified a specific problem there or can't see any evidence of, of one of the other problems you may have or diseases, I would really encourage you to take a sample for cyst nematode. Um, even if you're seeing that field overall reducing in yield uh, over the years and your corn yields are fine when you're in that field, that's a good indication that you could have this problem. Uh, soybean cyst nematode is also a, a, a disease problem that we see in a lot of Nebraska fields uh, and we won't see any symptoms associated with that. So really a lot of times it's just reduced yield. So if we're looking at sampling a field for soybean cyst nematode, uh, there's a few things to keep in mind. You can target those if you have a yield monitor and you have identified areas in the field in your map where you know you have lower yield, you can target those for sampling. You can target areas, field entryways, anywhere soil moves into that field is going to be a key point for trying to, to identify if it's in the field or not because that's how it gets there is movement with soil coming into your field. So target those entryways, low spots, uh, areas where, where water may run to as the cyst would float in water and move into those areas. So if you're doing this, then you're taking a, a soil probe or a shovel or something to get a, a soil sample out of there, we'd recommend about 20 to 25 soil cores from randomly selected from around the areas, some of those targeted areas we just mentioned. Taking those, um, I like to use just some sort of small bucket, an ice cream bucket, any kind of small pail works. Put those cores into the bucket, mix them up real well. Make sure you take advantage of that free soil sampling program that your checkoff dollars are funding through the Nebraska Soybean Board. And you can contact your local University of Nebraska link in the Extension Office, or you can contact our office directly to obtain some of those bags. Put that soil in the bag and then bring that in or send that in uh, to the Plant and Pest Diagnostic Clinic and the address for that is located on the bag. Again, the cost of the sample is covered by the Nebraska Soybean Board. You can obtain sample analysis bags from your local county extension office. Drought may be a common occurrence in the Great Plains, but it doesn't make it any easier to bear when it happens. In the October Nebraska Farmer, three ranchers tell how the 2012 drought stressed their grazing lands and how they managed through those drought conditions. The three are Jeff Pribino of Imperial, Douglas Olson of Banner County, and Dan Stelling of Pierce County. They each discuss how their grazing plans are made to fit their environments. They also told how corn stalks and other forages helped compensate for grass shortages. You can read their insights into drought planning in the October Nebraska Farmer. In January, United States Supreme Court Special Master concluded Nebraska's new Republican River Irrigation Regulations are sufficient to keep the state in compliance with the Republican River Basic Compact in dry years. UNL Extension Water Law Specialist Dave Aiken joined us earlier this week to discuss those plans and how they date back to a 2002 Republican River Compact lawsuit. In response to the lawsuit from Kansas, the NRDs and the Republican Basin have uh, put allocations on how much water irrigators can pump and have also said no more new wells. And uh, that is good enough in normal years, but in dry years, uh, we've ended up being over how much water we could legally use. When you say dry years, what does that technically mean? And then how often would that be likely to occur? Well, um, under the compact, uh, if the lake levels in Harlan County Reservoir mm -hmm. are below a certain point, then that's considered a dry year. Uh, but Historically, we've been in this dry year thing for well over half of the time uh, for the period of record, so it's a pretty frequent occurrence. Right. 2006, as you're looking at something like this, 2006 was an important year. Why was it important from Nebraska standards? Well, uh, it was the first year under the new compact accounting rules that we officially came up over how much we were able to use. We were about 8% over what we were supposed to use that year, and so we were in violation of the compact. And the response from Kansas was what in that situation? Well, they said that we needed to shut down about a million acres uh, of irrigated land in the basin uh, to stay in compliance for dryers in the future and also give them a lot of money. Right. right. Well, <laughs> that's just kind of a kicker there. So what are the plans that Nebraska is now proposing here? Well, the uh, uh, Department of Natural Resources and the three uh, Republican Basin NRDs have agreed that uh, if we are in going into a dry year mm -hmm. that the uh, NRDs will tell the farmers uh, 
in the so-called rapid response area uh, close to the river that they will not be able to pump that year. At all? At all. Uh, unless, for example, you know, if, if we get rains or something like that. And, and, sure, and okay. But the expectation would be going into that year, you're going to be dry. Wow. And, uh, and that was a big step. That would be the first time that we would have cut off existing surface or groundwater right. irrigators in Nebraska. So that's a pretty big deal. And under that situation, I mean, that would obviously fall into compliance with anything that would be necessary. That's, well, the uh, Department of Natural Resources actually modeled it. They went back mm -hmm. and modeled it, you know, for the, la for the last several years, which are some of the driest years on record. And we always came up, you know, in the green zone, you know, we're always right. legal uh, if that restriction was imposed. Kansas is okay with this? What's their recommendation on this? <laughs> well, they like their original proposal better, <laughs> but fortunately for us, the uh, Supreme Court special master just said, no, the model shows that the Nebraska plan would work. Right. And so, you know, we're going to give Nebraska a chance to go with this, and of course, if it doesn't work, then we'll look at it again. So under the situation where Nebraska irrigators wouldn't be allowed to pump, would they be reimbursed or paid anything under that? scenario? My expectation is that they would be. Uh, it's, you know, the, the regulations uh, don't require it. However, I think that the, uh, I think the NRDs would do that when push came right. to shove. Uh, this is obviously going to be a point of contention, not necessarily only in this area, but across the state. But uh, specifically, what are the NRDs doing here? Well, How are they tying in? The best thing that, uh, one of the great things that they're doing is they're trying to figure out how can we get more water into Harlan County Reservoir by January 1st so that we don't have to trigger this dry year regulation. And uh, to that extent, they've, they've uh, purchased uh, a, basically a big irrigated ranch in Lincoln County. Uh, they've, they've shut off the irrigation wells and they will going to use the water in dry years to go down to the Republican or even to the Platte. They have that capability, but they can go either way, but go down to the Republican, put water in Harlan County Reservoir so we avoid that dry year trigger and those uh, tough uh, groundwater regulations. What role does the state of Nebraska play, if any, here? Well, the state, uh, these projects are expensive. This is a mm, multi-million sure. dollar project. The NRDs could use help and the uh, we have the LB uh, 517, I believe, uh, Water Funding Task Force, which is meeting right now, they will make their final recommendations to the legislature in December, so that's something to keep an eye on. But that's what they're looking at funding, funding projects like this to help uh, in areas where they need it. In related news, the Upper Big Blue NRD will hold a public meeting to discuss proposed changes in their district. If adopted, those regulations would require all wells pumping 50 gallons per minute to be metered by January 1, 2015. Currently, only wells with that capacity are metered if they were installed from 2004 on. The regulations would also establish a five-year allocation of 45 inches per acre, or an average of 9 inches per year, if groundwater restrictions are triggered in the future. The meeting is scheduled for November 5th in York. While we may not have updated harvest numbers due to governmental shutdown in Washington, we do know this year's corn crop will set a record. September's crop report projected production at 13.8 billion bushels, approximately 3 billion bushels more than the output in 2012. Rationing demand was the talk last year, but this increase should provide plenty of corn to go around. That's positive news for livestock feeders who saw profit margins narrow, if not disappear, during 2012's drought. At the end of our previous episode's feature on renewable fuels in Nebraska, we mentioned last year's debate over waiving the ethanol mandate to allow for potentially more affordable feed. The EPA denied that request, and a recent study from the Ag Economics Department here at UNL shows it would have taken a substantial percentage waiver to completely offset drought effects. Between 60 and 70 percent of variable costs to livestock farmers and ranchers are categorized as feed costs. So when drought strikes major crop growing areas, the effects are not only felt by crop growers, but also by livestock producers. There are three main uses for corn, feed, ethanol, and exports. About 20 percent of Nebraska's corn for the 2012-2013 year will be used for feed. More than a third will be used for ethanol. While cattle feeders have found a benefit from using the co-products of ethanol production, when corn was burnt up from high heat and little rainfall, the two sides began to conflict. During good times, you know, there are no issues, especially when there is plenty of corn to go around. But uh, when you experience a drought like in 2012, uh, the interests of livestock producers and ethanol producers are naturally not aligned. 
It's true the feeding and ethanol sectors compete for corn no matter the size of the crop, but when the commodity begins to race towards $7 a bushel, that competition is much more magnified, as is the renewable fuel standard, which requires a certain volume of renewables be blended into transportation fuels. A recent UNL study, authored by Sunil Dubadel, Matt Stockton, and Azadina Zam, investigated how an ethanol mandate waiver would have affected U.S. corn prices. Their results showed in order to fully offset drought impacts and restore corn prices to 2011 levels, a 64% ethanol waiver would have been needed, translating to a 39% decrease in ethanol usage. Not something that would have happened, but it does show the drought's impact. The study also found an ease on prices could have been accomplished a different way. It could also be accomplished if there were enough rins, okay, that refiners can use to meet the mandate without actually blending ethanol. RINs are renewable identification numbers. They're used to track the volume of ethanol being produced. If more ethanol is produced than required, RIN credits are given and can be used in the future. So you can blend ethanol by actually blending the stuff or you can hand in to EPA some excess RINs, you know, to make up for the shortfall. 1.9 billion gallons of RIN credits were available at the end of last year. So in the situation that corn was too expensive to buy in 2012, UNL study showed using all RIN credits would have in theory acted as a 14% waiver of the ethanol mandate. Instead of eating up the market, you go to EPA and hand in your RINs without actually eating up that corn. Again, that was 2012. 2013's big corn crop should make the demand market for corn much, much different. Now in for this week's weather forecast, here is UNL Extension State Climatologist Al Dutcher. Well, folks, here we are again for the weekly forecast. Of course, the big news has been the continuation of the impacts felt from the blizzard that hit western uh, South Dakota and, of course, the northern panhandle of Nebraska. The cattle losses have been fairly exceptional, and by all best estimates, they're indicating maybe 5% of the total cattle population of South Dakota was lost during this storm. And, the big issue right now is, of course, dealing with the residual snow that's left over, trying to locate uh, cattle that have been wandering around and those that have perished in the storm. And unfortunately, with this new system that came out over this past 48 hours and another one projected to move out early next week, the areas that were hit with this heavy snowfall are likely to see one to possibly three inches of rainfall on top of that snow. So it's going to be a real mess. Couldn't buy the rain when we needed it, and now we're getting too much of a good thing in too short of a time scale. And with that rain, we also expect the rain to invade most of the state of Nebraska, so there's an opportunity to catch another one to possibly two inches of rainfall over this next five-day period, which gives us a real good start on the soil moisture for the 2014 growing season, but unfortunately, it's gonna cause some planting delay issues. And on top of it all, it does appear that enough cold air is coming with this next system early next week that we will bring in a fairly significant freeze risk to the northern two-thirds of the state. And by all accounts, most likely everybody will see very close to freezing conditions, at least those areas south of I-80. So let's take a look at the upper air models and see how they're going to progress these storms that are, should impact us over this next few days. And as we go to the upper air models, we'll draw your attention to the first system that had moved out of the central rockies and is now situated over uh, the core of that upper air low is situated over Wisconsin and the western Great Lakes. And so in its wake, we should see fairly benign conditions today. It's going to be slightly cooler than we've been experiencing the last few days. But overall, we're not expecting any major precipitation. But we'll draw your attention to this trough that's digging in behind this first trough that pushed out. This one is expected to make its way across our region as we go through the weekend and the early part of next week and bring a very widespread rain event to us. So by the time we get to tomorrow, we can start to see this storm system taking shape. Pulling down a lot of cold air on its backside, we should see some significant snow accumulations in the central Rockies, building on top of the snow that fell a little over a week ago. So the snow season is actually getting off to a good start. And as we go into Monday, the system starts to make its way into our region 
and the precipitation across western Nebraska should break out late Sunday night and really start to get us act going as we go through Monday and we'll start pulling the cold air in behind it. Right now there is no indication that we're going to see significant accumulations of snow. We may see a few flakes as the cold air arrives on Tuesday, but overall that should be across northern Nebraska and it should not be significant in, the, in terms of accumulations. As we get to Tuesday, this upper air low is moving toward Wisconsin, but we're going to have a lot of cold air on the backside and a lot of widespread heavy cloudiness and, unfortunately, rainfall associated with it. And that system should make its way into the eastern Great Lakes as we get into Tuesday evening. So by the time we get to Wednesday morning, we're going to be seeing that cold air filtering into our region, and there's a very good possibility that we will see hard freeze conditions. Uh, possibly Wednesday morning and most definitely Thursday morning as the cold air funnels down through southern Canada into our region. We will see clearing conditions with no precipitation, but that cold air will remain in place as this trough strengthens over the Great Lakes and pulls in cold air, particularly across the northeastern one-third of the state on Thursday. And by the time we get to Friday, we start to see that trough lifting out toward the Great Lakes and we start to see a ridging pattern building in to give us some drying conditions moving into the region for next weekend. Now as we look at the temperature, this is where things get a little dicey. We are going to slowly warm up on Saturday and possibly Monday before the temperatures drop and the bottom drops out. We'll be looking at highs in the low 40s up in the northwest part of the state to possibly the mid-50s across the southern part of the state. And then we will start to see a gradual warming trend toward next weekend. And if we look at the temperatures, that slow cooling trend will slowly evaporate from next Thursday through the following Tuesday. So we'll see below normal temperatures, but not that significantly below normal in terms of precipitation. We start to see the impacts of that ridge building in as drier air starts to work into our region. So we may actually start to see some decent harvest activity beginning late next weekend. Thanks, Al. Today's interviews with Mike Briggs, Lauren Giesler, Dave Aiken, and our feature on how drought changes corn prices can be found on our website or mobile app as part of the October 11th episode of Market Journal. Next week, Wade Johannes will be our marketing analyst. Stephen Wagulo will discuss winter wheat issues, and Lowell Sandell will talk about winter annual weed control. Until then, thanks for watching. I'm Jeff Wilkerson. We'll see you next week. Join Market Journal online at marketjournal.unl.edu. You can also follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine. Funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. The Soybean Checkoff, growing opportunity from the ground up. Market Journal is produced by the University of Nebraska Lincoln Extension, where you can know how, know now. Funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. No matter how you look at it, animal agriculture helps Nebraska's economy. The livestock industry provides increased tax revenues for schools and community services. Livestock enterprises also create jobs while contributing to existing businesses such as local banks and grocery stores. A thriving livestock industry helps maintain our current way of life, but also provides opportunities for the next generation of farm families. The Nebraska Soybean Checkoff helps to raise awareness of the importance of animal agriculture to Nebraska.